Well, where is the natural man according to the book of Ephesians chapter 1, or chapter 2, verses 1 through 4? Dead in trespasses and what? Okay, so if the way I get saved is to turn from sin, and I'm going this way, and the way I get saved is to turn from sin, and I turn this way and start going that way, I'm still where? I'm still where? I'm still in my sin, aren't I? What do I need? I need somebody to redeem me, to purchase me, to buy me, to lutro me out of my what? Sin. So he gave himself for us so that he might redeem us. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Being justified, how? Freely. By his grace, notice, through the what? Redemption that is in who? Why is the redemption in Christ Jesus? Because who is the one that gave himself for us? It's Christ Jesus. There is no redemption outside of Jesus Christ. There is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. I don't care what the world religions say. I don't care what the politically correct PC stuff is. If Christians are closed-minded and dogmatic and all that other stuff, fine, I am. Because I have a Bible that tells me that there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man who? Christ Jesus. I have a Bible that tells me that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby a man must be saved. The redemption is in Jesus Christ because He is the one who gave Himself, paid the price, and satisfied the offended justice of God against our sin. Okay? Now come back with me to Titus chapter 2. And I've kind of already made this point, but we need to stress it here. <coughs> we need to stress it in verse 14 who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us. How many sins have you and I been redeemed from? All iniquity. Titus chapter 2, verse 14 says all iniquity. The word iniquity means a violation of the law or wickedness. You know, We've been studying lately a lot in this assembly over the last couple of weeks about the fact that the law can never what? Save you, right? The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to who? All men. We're saved by grace through faith. How do we walk in our Christian life in service to God? The same way that we received Him, right? How did you receive Him? By grace through faith. That's why he says in Titus, that's why he says in verse 12, teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What is the thing that is doing the teaching in verse 12? It's the grace of God back in verse what? 11. Read the verse. For the, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to who? All men teaching us. So who's teaching us in verse 12? The grace of God. What does it teach us? It teaches us. How to live soberly, righteously, and what? And godly. So we have been saved, folks. Redeemed. Bought out. Christ paid the price. And freed us and forgiven, as has forgiven us from all our iniquity. Now, if you would, come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Just a little bit more on this. <clears throat> Look at verse 7. Still talking about Christ here. It says, in whom, that's Christ, we have what? Redemption. How? Through His what? You see the fact? There, there's the issue of Him giving Himself for us, right? So read that verse. In whom we have redemption, how? How? Through His blood. We'll go back to Titus in your mind, verse 14. Who gave Himself for us that He might what? Redeem us. Okay? So when He gave Himself for us on the cross, and He was obedient unto that death, He shed His what? Blood to pay for our what? 
Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood. Notice, the forgiveness of what? S-I-N. S. Now, that little S at the end of that word, does that change the meaning of the word? Because when you put that S at the end of sin, it's not talking about one sin, it's talking about what? All sins. And so the verse then says in verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of what? Listen, if I could come out there and I could just sear in your mind, it would be this reality that every single thing, every flaw, every mistake, every failure, every impure thought, every, every word and deed that is not in line with Scripture, every single offense, every single sin, every single transgression and iniquity has been totally bought and paid for and is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you and I today are possessors of a total, complete forgiveness of sin. Now I know 1 John 1.9. And I know what the denominational teachers want to do with 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? That verse is used to teach that when you and I sin, we fall out of fellowship with God. And so the way we restore fellowship with God is we go and confess our what? Our sin, and then He brings us back into fellowship. Just read the verse. 1 John 1 9. Why don't we look at it? That'd help, wouldn't it? <coughs> 1 John 1 9. First of all, folks, you've got to notice what is the first word of that verse? It's a conditional verse, is it not? If we what? Confess our sin. What's the next word? Then, what's the principle of the law? The principle of the law is if you do this, then you'll get what? This. If you don't do this, then you'll get this. It's a system of conditional blessing and curses. First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So first of all, He's going to forgive you of how many of your sins? S-I-N singular or S-I-N-S? Okay? And to cleanse us from all what? How many times can that happen to you? This verse is not a short account system verse. This verse is a salvation verse for Israel during the tribulation about how they are going to get saved as they go through the tribulation period. To take that verse out of its context and to say that that's the verse that you, that you restore fellowship with God when you confess your sins isn't even what the verse says. Because the verse says that once God does this for you, He forgives you of your sins, S-I-N-S, and also, what? Cleanses you from all unrighteousness. How many times can that happen to you? One time. You, we, we have to rejoice in the total, complete forgiveness of sins that we have in Jesus Christ. Come with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 14. Colossians 1.14, in whom, that's Christ, we have what? Again, if you are saved, are you a present possessor of redemption? We have what, that verse says. We have redemption. Why? Because Christ gave Himself for who? For us. Okay, verse 14. In whom we have redemption, here it is, through his what? Do you know that if you have a modern translation of the Word of God here this morning in NIV or New American Standard, it leaves off the phrase, through His blood? Does that change the meaning of the verse? 
Isn't there a verse in Hebrews that said that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins? Doesn't the, doesn't the Bible say that? So why in the, world would, why in the world would somebody come up with the weird idea to take that out of the Bible? Unless they are purposely trying to obscure the issue of redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. In whom we have redemption through His what? Blood. There it is again. Didn't, didn't Ephesians 1, 7 say the same thing? Notice. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of what? Jesus Christ has taken care of every single thing that is wrong with you and I. Go to Colossians 2, verse 13. But you see, you want to know, a lot of people, they don't, they don't like this message. And I'll touch on this at the end here. They don't like this message. You want to know why? Because they think that they've got to control people. So if you teach people that all their sins are forgiven and that they're under grace and they're all in the blood and all this and that, well, then you're just giving them license to do whatever they want. We've been over that, haven't we? Is that what we're saying? Have you ever heard me say, oh, you're under grace, go do what you want? <clears throat> Hasn't the whole point of Titus chapter 2 been the things which become sound doctrine? Okay? Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, he says, and you, being dead in your what? Sins. And the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened, that's made alive, together with Him, having forgiven you all what? Do you see in that verse where it says, having forgiven? Is that past? present or future tense? That's past tense. The moment you trusted the shed blood of Jesus Christ, not your effort, not your performance, and that and that alone and His resurrection from the dead, the blood of Jesus Christ washed away all of your what? Sins. Now, if that's not a message that you can get happy about, I don't know what you're waiting for. Now, it's okay to get excited at church. When you're watching the ball game at home and something good happens, you're not like, huh. Eh, it's a great play. You're all like, woo! Well, we should be multiplied excited about this than that temporal stuff that we watch. This is dealing with who God has made you in Jesus Christ. Total, complete, blood-bought, saved, sealed, and sanctified member of the church, the body of Christ. Requiring no merit of your own, nothing that you could do to earn it, given to you freely and exclusively when you rely on what Christ did on your behalf. He comes and He redeems you out of sin, and His blood washes your sin away, and you are forgiven of all what? trespasses, all sin, all iniquity. Come with me back now to Titus chapter 2. Verse 14. <coughs> Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us. What's the next word? That, okay. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. What's the first word after iniquity? And, so is there something else He did? So He didn't just give Himself for you. He didn't just redeem you from all iniquity. Now is there another thing He did for you in that verse? No, look at it again. Who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and. So there's a second thing that His giving Himself for us has, has, has resulted for you and I. And purify unto Himself a peculiar why? People. The second reason why Christ gave Himself for us is, the, is that so that He could purify unto Himself a peculiar people. Now when it says peculiar, does that mean that we're all strange? Well, some of us may be more than others. This is the only time that Paul 
uses the word peculiar in any of his writings. The word means beyond unusual, i.e., special. It's not just that you're weird, it's that you're what? You're special.